Welcome to the Q&A Cafe. I'm very grateful to the Georgetown Club for having us here today. And I also want to say I'm grateful to District Donut and Greg Mena. And when this show ends, I want you to go next door and feast on donuts that he brought here today. Because I may forget to tell you that's why I'm saying it here at the beginning. But uh, most of all, I'm just very happy to welcome Dan Rather. Thank you. Back to the Q&A Cafe. Uh, I reminded him just a little while ago when we basically did the whole interview in the back room <laughs> that, um, that we last did this in 2007. Can't believe it was that long can you ago. Neither one of us can remember back then, right? No, no. Actually, I, do you mind if I just start right off no, do. with saying your age? Because I think you look amazing. No, no. no. Listen, you are, you are 83 it, years old, right? Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank now, thank you. that... Thank you. That definitely ages me, too, because I've known Dan since 1972, and right. I was already working when we first met. When but, you were nine years old. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, we've had a long, uh, wonderful friendship, and uh, I've had the benefit of working together but also being friends outside the office which True. is the best the best possible <laughs> in our world but um, we did almost give away the interview but but not all of it and um, you do look good thank you and uh, I'm I'm what are you doing now what you've got a lot you're, you're a busy active man and I, I figured I'd just better ask you <laughs> all your different jobs because you've got several different hats well, I do have several different hats, but all are connected to the fact that, you know, my life is, has been, as an adult, about reporting, and it still is. Mm -hmm. and I've yep. been really lucky, mighty lucky and uh, blessed to mm -hmm. be able to make a living doing what I always had a passion for doing. Basically, what my basic job is working for Mark Cuban, an entrepreneur out of Texas mm -hmm. who owns the Dallas Mavericks. He also owns a television uh, network. Mm -hmm. It's now called Access, A X S. TV. Which was originally HDNet. HDNet. Okay. Mark Cuban was uh, pressing it about uh, the coming of high definition television. Mm, yeah. So he formed an, a, a network built around high definition television. But once everybody got high definition television, he uh, repurposed his cable network, mm -hmm. if you will. But at any rate, I work for Mark Cuban. I do a one hour weekly news program for him, mm -hmm. in which is a combination now of what we call quote, the big interview. Mm. We can debate whether how big the interview is, but that's the name of the program in which I interview people uh, basically in the music and movie industry, in-depth mm -hmm. interviews. Unfortunately, we don't touch on much foreign policy or investigative reporting, but I do, do, you care? I do hours for him on, on what, which we specialize in, in deep digging investigative reporting and international reporting and some politics. That's basically what I do. I also like to write, of course, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and I'm but of always, course. I'm always working on a book and working on a new book. And I had a book a mm, year before last called... Uh, uh, was your, it was your memoir. It was yeah, looking back well, at CBS. Yeah, it was rather outspoken yeah. was the title yeah, of it. Yeah, and you were outspoken. But, uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I, I blog from time to time on Daily Beast and the Huffington Post. And you're the that's, ultimate that's social how, that's media That's how my do. professional work, life goes. Yeah, well, that, it wasn't so you're busy and traveling all the time, because I assume if you're interviewing people in the entertainment industry, you're going to them as I much am. as they're coming and to I you. Say these, we do one hour produced interviews mm -hmm. with people, and this is at Mark Cuban's request, because he's repurposed part of the network to be uh, a live music venue, yeah. and therefore our interviews are in service of that. Um, so when we last talked in 07, um, you had just filed suit against CBS. True. A lawsuit that ultimately went away. Right. And then you wrote your book. Mm -hmm. And did the book help? Is the book, is writing the book as good for you emotionally as if you'd gone forward with the lawsuit and won? No. Well, first of all, we lost the lawsuit. But, you were, okay, very, you but, were very kind to say it went away. Well, and I appreciate the euphemism. But it never even got uh, to court. It didn't even get but, to court, did uh, it? Look, it was always odds against with the lawsuit. Right. Uh, and some things uh, are worth fighting for even if you lose. And mm -hmm. that was the case with the lawsuit. Uh, I t went into the lawsuit reluctantly. We won't talk much about it, but I went into right. it very reluctantly. But, and only because I realized that too late for me uh, that CBS... CBS corporate was trying to erase me from the history of CBS News, which I didn't think was possible to do. 
and also because I wanted to find out what happened, what really happened in the wake of our story about George Bush's military service or lack of same. But we lost the lawsuit, but we found out a lot through the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, were you able to use it in your book? What you found I, well, but the book was not intended, however it may appear, the book was not intended to be a uh, redemption. I didn't particularly want to write about it because it was eight or nine years after the fact. It's in my rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. I did the best I could. I'm very pleased and proud and always been uh, honored to have worked at CBS News for 44 years, 24 years in the anchor chair. And uh, I didn't do it perfectly. I have my fault. Does that mean you've made a sure. kind of peace, Dan? Oh, no, I made a peace with it a long time ago. Really? The last time I talked to you, I was not at peace. No, you were not. Because In fact, I, you got very upset when you were talking about CBS. Well, I don't remember getting very upset about it, but I was upset yeah. about what had happened. Yeah. But uh, I can truly say now that I rarely think about it anymore. I'm at peace because I've gone on for, for this job I'm with Mark Cuban. We've now done almost 300 hours, 300 one you hour moved on. program. Yeah. But moved then on. maybe you have the yeah. distance to be able to shed some light on why, and you use, and you use the word erased, right. that CBS News erased you. Mm -hmm. Well, they did the same thing to Walter Cronkite after you succeeded him. Yeah. Walter, who we both know very well. Yeah. And what, what is it about CBS News that that's the way it has to go when the, when the marriage has ended? Well, I think, first of all, I always like to make a difference between CBS as a corporate entity and yeah. CBS News. I still have a lot of friends at CBS News. As we both do, yes. You know, not all of them can speak up. Uh, as, well, uh, there you go. Uh, that, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard to compare the, the eras, if you will, uh, of the late, great, Walter Cronkite at his time, because Bill Paley, who formed CBS, was still at CBS when yeah. the change in anchor was made. But I, you know, I think it is there's such a different mindset with corporate with the corporation that CBS is now owned by Viacom, which is a huge international conglomerate, and they have a lot of interest. News is, a, is an almost infinitesimal part of what yeah. Viacom does. They don't give lip service to that, but that is a fact. And I think that had to do a lot to do with the effort to erase my time at CBS News. I want to make it clear when I say erase. For example, uh, we broke the story of Abu Ghraib. Uh, yes, was a, I, well, I, listen, I was going to get to we, that. We, we broke the story. Well, but you can't find that report anywhere. That you, you get up on the internet and try to find our report on Abu Ghraib. Right, I tried. Yeah, it's disappeared. Well, you can't find it. It's disappeared. It, yeah. Same thing with the Bush story. Whatever you think of the Bush story, you like it, don't like it, don't know what to think. If someone How are they is, able to do that? Well, because they own the property. That when we did the Abu Ghraib story, it was uh, done by CBS News, a division of Viacom Corporation. So and they, what year was that, and how far in advance was it of when the rest of us found out about Abu Ghraib? Well, we broke the story in 2004, I believe it was February, mm -hmm. early 2004. And then what happened with CBS? Well, uh, they played it one time mm -hmm. and one time only. We wanted to follow up on it because we, we knew that the CIA and others were doing a lot of other interrogation mm -hmm. work. Um, but it was move on then. They, they never knew what to do with the story and they, they tried not to run it. Um, but competitors began to breathe down our neck, so they had to run it. Longer story, read the book, touch about it. Well, let but me ask that. you this then, um, because it is very timely. How did you feel when the Senate CIA torture report came out this week? Well, I was appalled, I think, everybody else. And having said that in 2004, in the process of breaking the Abu Ghraib story, when I say break it, we didn't just break it on television. We broke it everywhere, everywhere, mm -hmm. news, radio, television, we broke it. Um, that we knew what had happened at Abu Ghraib. We had rock solid and we had the pictures, which is one reason it couldn't be, it couldn't be denied. But we also knew that this is, was happening other places, but because we were not able to follow up on our original Abu Ghraib report, having been told, listen, get off of, do something else, yeah. that the corporate side of the network seemed to be embarrassed about the fact that we had broken a, a major story. But it, for example, it bothered- Was it explained to you that way? Um, 
pretty much. Or in the subtleties and the Well, nuances it was much more subtle than that. Yeah. It was just, listen, this, this is a controversial story, and we're, we're looking after your reputation, so we just assumed, yeah. And I said, well, let me look after my <laughs> reputation, because I'm a reporter, I'd like to break another story. Yeah. But uh, 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 with this most recent report, uh, I can't say, because it wouldn't be true, that I had any idea that, that what has now been called by the president himself as torture was as pervasive as it turned out to be. What we did know, and what we had uh, only a piece of the story that I'm afraid, is that contractors were being used to do some of the, the worst things that were done at Abu Ghraib. Mm -hmm. And so by extrapolation, we said that probably contractors are being used in places like Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, yeah. one of the places we wanted to go to. But it seems, you know, Abu Ghraib now seems long ago and far away. But it was, if you will, uh, the canary in the coal mine. Did you ever think experience. you'd see a day when a director of the CIA would have a news conference? No. In fact, I, even today, you know, some, some things surprise me to this day a lot. And just to read in the paper, it kind of jumps off the page that they hold a news conference at the CIA. At the CIA. I can remember the time come. when we had to negotiate, I don't know, for months, even, not, not a year. We did a piece on the CIA in 1976 for 60 Minutes. Um, but it took about a year's negotiation just to even get on the premises. They weren't holding any news conferences, mm -hmm. which just get in the major hallway. No, I never thought I'd live to see the day. But I also never thought I'd live to see the day uh, when what was exposed in the Senate uh, report uh, was exposed as truth. I, I just never, frankly, having known some of what was going on, uh, I think with the rest of the country, I was. You know, truly shocked mm -hmm. at how pervasive it had been and how many people were contracted to do the work and how much money they made. There's still a story there. You know, it's, it's it, axiom in journalism, if you want to know what goes on, follow the dollar. And uh, there's a lot of reporting to be done on who got these contracts to do the torture mm -hmm. and why these particular people got those contracts and who made the money, uh, who set the contracts. Uh, I doubt that they'll ever be exposed, but there's a hell of a story there somewhere. Every time these things happen, I'm always struck with the thought of what's happening right now that we're going to find out about in three years, right? Oh. right. You just got to keep digging. There's another story that's in the news that kind of intersects with your life, too, in that um, you grew up in the segregated South in Texas. You okay. covered the Civil Rights Movement. Okay. And here we are, all these years later, with what's happening in Ferguson, what's happening with Eric Garner, and if you go back a little bit with Trayvon Martin. And I was very interested in what, how you view these events in light of your experience, both growing up but also covering the civil rights movement. Well, my, my first big assignment for CBS News was to cover the, what was then the early civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. That changed me as a person, as a man, as well as changed me as a pro, because I had grown up uh, in a segregated Texas with institutionalized racism, but had no idea uh, of how virulent it could be. Mm -hmm. uh, but in answer to your question. So, what do you make of this, now? Well, what is this I make about? of now somewhat as I made of it then. Um, and it's never left me. Uh, I'm convinced, I was in the early 60s and have been ever since, that uh, when the history of, the, of our beloved United States of America is written, I hope it will be thousands of years from now, but the last land on our country in this great historical experiment, the last land is going to deal with how, how we handle race. No country in the world, no people in the world ever tried to do what we have tried to do in this country, and that is have a constitutional republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy that's made up of, of a population with a tremendous mix of uh, race, ethnic differences, religious differences. Uh, this is a noble experiment, but the verdict is still out. Yeah, and so fact, how would you measure where we are now versus then? Look, there's no comparison. We, we've made some tremendous headway, mm -hmm. and yes, point to the most obvious example. We have a president of the United States of color. Um, you know, I'm not a historian, I'm a workaday reporter, but as best I can figure out, there has never been 
no nation on earth, no large population tribe on earth has ever had as its leader uh, for very long uh, and no freely elected time of, of minority race. We're the first and only people ever to do it. Now, using that as an example and others, we've certainly have come a long way since the 1960s. And most importantly, there was institutionalized racism in many of our states, including uh, Texas. The institutionalized racism has been reduced tremendously. But we're now in the second decade of the 21st century, and we still have not, <laughs> uh, we're still working, we're trying, you know, trying to figure that, it out. That phrase, how do we get along? Can yeah, we get along? Yeah. Is a big thing. And my do personal opinion, it is my, I'm sorry, my personal opinion, we either need a dramatically revitalized civil rights movement, or we need a new civil rights movement uh, dealing with race. One can argue that we've gone through a civil rights movement dealing with um, sexual orientation, but they, it, it, there's this tendency in the country to believe, well, we've solved the race problem. Look, we have a president who's African-American. Uh, we have... Yeah, but Dan, let me ask you, to what extent do you think President Obama, the, the treatment, is filtered through a veil of racism that still exists. That you mean opinions of him? Yes, and that. And I don't that, think there's any question that, uh, that, that, that race is a factor. I would argue a major factor yeah. in the current assessments that you read in many places with race. But, you know, I know the argument says, "Oh, come on, Dan. Listen, he was elected president, and race no longer has anything to do with it." I don't think that's true at all. I do think that opinions of President Obama, not in every case, and not by everybody but to a much larger extent than we're, any of us are prepared to admit uh, they are put through the, the veil, the prison, if you will, uh, of his race. Uh, I think he realizes that probably better than the rest of us. Uh, history, we, well, you know, his place in history is secure as the first yeah. person of African American heritage to be president. What he was hoping to do is make it a great presidency beyond that. Yeah. History books will note that he's the first person of color to be president. I think uh, as things turned out, it'll be very mixed on whether you ran an effective presidency or not. Yeah, I've always been um, struck by the degree to which the people who oppose him, um, that, they've just ne that it's just never let up the drumbeat about where, where he was born, whether he's uh, you know, a follow follower of the Islamic faith, you know, there's just this unrelenting negativity that that I want to say, if we could present his poli his accomplishments, you know, in a colorblind way, what would these same people say? Because basically, he's done much of what he set out to do, and it's just well, there's truth in that. But I, having acknowledged that, I think it's also important to, to note um, that there are people who are critical of President Obama and very critical. Of him. Who do not put it through? Oh, what that's we're true. Called the yeah, but I'm only talking. We don't, we don't want to overgeneralize. Right. But the basic thing has 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 the opinion of him overall in the main been affected by this, what you call this drumbeat, which sometimes overtly and sometimes covertly mm -hmm. deals with race. The answer is yes, and I think any reasonably uh, decent person seeking to objectively analyze the situation would say the same. I want to be, again, I, I, to italicize, that doesn't mean he hasn't made mistakes. Right. I, I mean, I could list Presidents at least perfect. five that I think he's made myself. If I may, Carol, I want to go back before we leave the CIA mm -hmm. thing, because I, I promised myself that I'd say this to you, because you know Washington, Washington. Is it possible, I mean, right now, there's great heat about this story, and there should mm -hmm. be. Every, yeah. every day is a headline, every night on the news. But when we get a little bit of distance between ourselves and the Senate report, is it possible that we could have a reasonable, rational debate about whether the CIA should exist at all? And before you jump to the conclusion, we need intelligence. We need an intelligence agency, in my opinion. We need a civilian intelligence agency. But there's a debate to be had, and to, to suggest there's a debate to be had is not to, to be had is not to say which side of that debate I'd be on. But the CIA is a very large bureaucracy. It's become a huge bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. It has been for a long time. And you know, time after time, we go through a period and we say, you know what? They've been out of control. They were out of control at the time of this torture. 
Do you think they're out of control said, now? I think an argument can be made mm -hmm. uh, that that out of control might be too strong, but there's not enough there's not, not enough of a built-in system of checks and balances mm -hmm. on the CIA. That if the CIA, since the CIA, we now know, did these things in our name, mm -hmm. uh, which it's in, they're inconsistent okay. with their values, they're inconsistent with the policies of the presidents at the time. And I don't want to be among those that jump all over the CIA now. When oh, go going ahead. Through a hard time. No, it's not in me. I know too many people, good people who work mm -hmm. the agency. But my question to you was, it was a question, do you think we're capable of having this debate? We may decide, listen, no, the CIA can reform itself. Maybe they need to remain. But can we have that debate? Are you suggesting it's an examination for the Hill to host? Is the Hill capable of hosting anything? That's a very good question. That's, that's a very good question. But what, what, what would be the next iteration of the CIA? Because you already said we have to have an intelligence capacity. Absolutely. Well, the next would be something, um, first of all, to do with what we have and say, look, it's like some other huge bureaucracy. So it's just break gotten up too the CIA So let's just tear down what we have mm -hmm. and start from scratch with a new civilian agency of the CIA. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid it, in this day and age what they'd end up doing is just, I mean, look what happened with Homeland Security. You talk about a giant bloated agency. Well, talk about a giant bloated agency. And uh, has it been effective? We right. don't, you know, again, the history of it. Really. But look, I, I want to be careful. I, I'm not an expert on intelligence. I'm not an ex expert on fighting terrorism. But we do know that when bureaucracies get beyond a certain size, mm -hmm. there's a tendency for them to become first ineffective and then counter-effective, yeah. if you will. And one of the lessons of the old Soviet Union, who wants to talk about the old Soviet Union? You know, having been there many, many times, Communism never scared me. It was the, the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union that scared me. Uh, and I said to myself, you know, we have our own bureaucracy. Think how many times you've had to fight the, when you look at all your greatest stories, to some extent you are fighting the bureaucracy. Yes. So Which, we just raised the question. And, a, a, you know, a, a companion question would be with the FBI. Mm -hmm. and, can we have a debate? Is the FBI too large, too bureaucratic to effectively do what we, we if we don't have this, this FBI, then yeah. we have to start over and start a new one. But is it time to think, start thinking about doing that? This would be what a wonderful subject for your show, you know, getting rid of the FBI, Stay getting tuned. rid of the CIA <laughs> and starting over again. Um, uh, you were mentioning Obama. Have, have you met him? Have you interviewed him? I have. Him? And so your presidents go back, sadly, to Kennedy. I mean, because that was the first president you covered, and even then you really didn't cover him as you a know, white You know, I actually interviewed course. President Eisenhower once. So you, okay, so how old were you when you did that? Uh, Working for the high school I think newspaper? I was, what, uh, 26? Oh, okay. Well, all right. So, so you know, you've, you, in one way or another, you've intersected with, the, the, all the presidents of the That's recent true. past, and some more dramatically than others. Right. When you get dramatic with a president, <laughs> Dan, you get very dramatic. <laughs> but um, have you, let's just take two of them that right. really rose to the surface with you and Nixon and Bush. With either of them, have you reassessed your, your relationships with them, what happened with them, what you thought of them, what you think of their presidencies? Do you think history will see either one of them differently than we thought we were seeing them at the time? What a good question. I do uh, ask myself that question from time to time and, and reassess. Uh, up to and including now, I think uh, history's verdict on Richard Nixon will be pretty much what it is now, which is to say a tragedy. Uh, someone who came to the presidency with tremendous possibilities and tremendous potential. Uh, but in the end, uh, it was about a widespread criminal conspiracy led in part by the president of the United States. Exclamation point is still hard for me to believe. And I think that whatever uh, the things that President Nixon gets credit for, uh, which he deserves, opening to China, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, mm -hmm. It'll always be in the first graph that he was the oh, yeah. first yeah. and perhaps only president uh, 
to leave office uh, as an unindicted co-conspirator, mm -hmm. that's what the grand jury called him in a widespread yeah. criminal conspiracy. With President, I think he was H. W. George H. W. Bush. Bush. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the way I see the, that Bush presidency now, it was really the third Reagan term, is the way you think of it. Mm -hmm. That President Reagan could have been elected to a third term if it had been right. the, uh, whether you like him or dislike him, that was ways of God. Mm -hmm. And so I think history will see, as many of us now see, the H. W. Uh, George H. W. Bush you presidency, call him 41. If, if for, be uh, seen as a continuation mm -hmm. of what President Reagan started, and therefore a kind of third Reagan term. Uh, and I think he will be seen as in that broad middle of American presidents, perhaps mm, lower middle part, not a Jefferson or a Washington. Not he has more affection, year. perhaps, than historic significance, maybe? I mean, yeah, except I, I, for, the, except for the, the, the first Gulf War was a remarkable. It was remarkable, but, but, but. and this is frequently the way with presidents, um, as it turned out, uh, he ended the war. He could have gone on to Baghdad. Yeah, no, it was and, a, and I'm not so sure history will see that as his, his see his decision of not going to Baghdad at the time. Yeah, because uh, current history even is, current history is, says that was a good thing for him to do. But now beginning to get harsher, and I think history. But I want to make clear what with with since his was a one-term presidency. Uh, with he may what we view how we view his presidency today. Maybe very well be what history says about him. Was was what went on with you and the Bushes ever about Texas? Nothing went on with us about Texas. No, uh, but I mean, was there a part of you that was like, they're not really Texas? No, I never felt that. Uh, many Texans did feel it. Yeah, when they, that's when they why. Were coming I asked. up until they got until they got successful. Yeah. No, I never felt that. I never had any trouble. Widely believed it may not be, but true yeah. it is. I never had any great difficulty with the Bushes, and if anything, were, was rather inclined to like, particularly the elder Bush. Yeah. Remember, I was a child during World War II. Yeah. Uh, he was a bona fide, certified war hero, mm -hmm. uh, and I felt well about him. Uh, it's a little akin to people saying, well, how'd you feel about Lyndon Johnson? He was a Texan, a bigger than life Texan. Surely you got along with him. You know, I'm a reporter, and re reporters are supposed to ask tough questions. Mm -hmm. And when you ask tough questions, uh, not everybody loves you. And so. But looking what, what, back is so interesting. What, and uh, Well, what it was with, with the Bushes, and I got along, always got along very well with, with the father, with the first uh, President Bush, mm -hmm. when he was coming up. Uh, it was only after I started asking really tough questions and tough follow up questions about what he had said uh, was his role in Iran-Contra, which mm -hmm. let's keep in mind what Iran-Contra was, mm -hmm. that we sent, secretly sent, some of the most sophisticated United States weaponry to the Ayatollahs in Iran, secretly, partly to get the money to finance a, a war, a very highly questionable or illegal war in Central America. So my trouble with pres that President Bush, mm -hmm. and I think it led to later troubles with the Bushes in general, was when what he was saying didn't match the record. Mm -hmm. Now, he later had acknowledged that the thrust of our questions were correct, but at the time it was not politically expedient for him to do so. So it started there. That's right. where the trouble started. Of all the presidents you've covered, mm -hmm. who do you think was the best at doing the job? And I, best may not be the right word, but who was the most effective? Pre who represented, who do you think history will look back on with the most favor? Well, I think uh, President Johnson and probably uh, President Reagan. Uh, I'm a believer that President Eisenhower will be treated better as history goes along. Pretty mm -hmm. good two-term president. But President Johnson uh, had a historic presidency in terms of domestic policy. Yes, it, there will always be Vietnam and he'll always be graded mm -hmm. down from mm -hmm. Vietnam. But you look at what uh, the legislation passed with President Johnson in his uh, time, particularly at dealing with uh, race and institutionalized racism, I think uh, President Johnson and President Reagan, again, whether you, you can like him or not like him, agree with his policies, disagree with his policies, 
but he changed the course of politics in the country, not, not just for the two terms he was president, yeah. but uh, for up to and including the present time. So you say, what which two were too effective? Again, you know, I could go, President Clinton, uh, who's not everybody's cup of tea, and again, let me say you can agree or disagree, but you look at his presidency, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly his presidency ended on a high note in terms of where the country was at peace and economically um, very, very sound. Um, uh, he, he had an effective presidency. LBJ was interesting, too, because really when you look back on it, his, his was the last presidency before the White House learned to embrace television and really use television. And you go and, and I think that for to some you know to some generations when you look at the when you look at LBJ you're not seeing him as he was because you're seeing him in these kind of archaic newsreels that don't make because you know Reagan still to this day the the available media on him he was such a dynamic performer right. uh, even even Nixon though it failed him his, the people around him knew how to use television well that's a very good point if you contrast President Johnson, who was terrible on television, and he knew he was terrible on television. And you're not allowed to be that anymore. And he tried everything. Yeah. To, he did everything trying to increase his ability to be effective on television. Yeah. Uh, all failure. Uh, President Reagan, a very accomplished <coughs> performer before he got there, so no surprise, but President Reagan, in terms of communicating and being on television, almost could do no wrong every time he turns in contrast the two. But that's a very good point about television. The President Kennedy had said of him, and it's true, Kennedy's was the first television presidency. We had television before then. Yeah. But no president really tried to use it effectively. Right. President Kennedy did. And it was almost because he had that charisma. He did. They, they may not even have known what it was at that time. Because well, in television terms, President Kennedy had the ability. He president was good, he was good on the too. air. The phrase is, to get through the glass, I'm told yeah. it's an actor's term, but that is, well, television set has this When did you screen. know you had it? I, I never learned that I had it because you, I, you I, I never thought I had it. Everybody who's on television has to, at some point, make peace with the with that light. Well, that's true, but that's different than having... Because you almost glass. feel it. It's, yeah. it, it. It drags well, you uh, in. Uh, I, I always felt... My strength, if I had one, and I, there are plenty of people who want to argue that I never had any strength, but <laughs> my strength is as a field reporter. I was not a natural anchor person. So you say, well, if you weren't a natural anchor person, how did you manage to survive 24 years in the anchor chair, which is longer than anybody ever done it, has done it? Uh, I think it, it's a matter of, of authenticity. If the audience senses that you're authentic, that yeah. they're looking at the real person, I think with with myself, people said, look, he may not be the best uh, pure anchor to come along, but you know what? The guy loves covering news. I think that was the book on me. I never it, felt it got through the plan. You know what's interesting? Because um, it always comes up uh, about when you became anchor and that uh, there was, you know, if you go back as I have and you look at the reporting and writing about the transition from Cronkite to you, there's always a lot made out of uh, animosity between you and Walter. Didn't exist but, at that but, time. but you know, I was there. Yeah. Uh, I was actually, I had the benefit of being the kid <laughs> sitting on the set during the whole drama of whether it would be Roger Mudd or whether it would be Dan Rather, <laughs> whether it be Roger Mudd, whether it be Dan Rather. But you were always Walter's choice. That's true. You, 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 he saw you. I don't know about always, but he told me in, in the end. Uh, we knew it. Those but, of us yeah. on the show knew it. Yeah. He, he, he just thought of you yeah. as being his kind of people. Well, that's the reason I can say with uh, I, I'm, I'm beware of certitude, but I'm sure. Walter told me himself that. And he, there was no animosity between There's a lot of mythology about this. And we don't need to spend much time on it, but who cares, I guess, in the end. But... Um, Walter was, you know, he was anchor. I was a field reporter. He was terrific to me when I was in the field. I like to think I was, gave him what he needed from mm -hmm. the broadcast. We got along fine. There was no animosity until Walter had been retired for a Until while. you got the job. <laughs> well, no, and he yeah. he said, look, I, you're my choice. And I think he told the people at CBS News, if yeah. you have to choose between the two rather uh, uh, experienced overseas and some other things, but it, Walter decided after he had retired that he retired too soon. 
Yeah. And, and other you cases think you be. retired too late. Uh, no. Don't you? I, don't. I think you thought you said that you thought you stayed in the anchor chair a little longer well, than you Well, I, I said a case can be made they stayed too long. Yeah. But in my heart of hearts, I never felt. Listen, I loved every minute of it. I, I loved the responsibility of it. And uh, I do I Walter, miss it? You bet. I think Walter kicked himself because he didn't see what was around the corner. He didn't no. see that in another couple of years the money was just going to go crazy. Well, uh, we won't spend again much time on this, but <laughs> I disagree with you because Walter made big money. For Walter, then. For yeah, then. He, he made, made big He money. made huge money. But then there was bigger then, money to be made. Well, that is true because <laughs> we see this in baseball that Mickey Mantle never made more than $100,000 a year, but when he made $100,000 a year, <laughs> yeah, that was he was best, it was a huge amount, amount of money. I, I do th think you're right, though, that uh, it's inevitable that I think after a few years, Walter would say, boy, if I, I could have stayed another five years, I should, might have, could have, should have been stayed. Uh, but he'd forgotten, and this is not criti critical of you. you, you have never heard a critical word from me about Walter Cronkite. Nor will you. Yeah, yes, well, it's, it's true. It's true. But I will say this, Walter, that he 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 wanted to go out on top, and he heard the footsteps of ABC and Moon Orange gathering on it. He told me this himself. He wanted to go out on top. He he was a ratings winner and a demographics winner, mm -hmm. but it was narrowing down, and he got out partly because he wanted to go out on top, like Ted Williams hit a home run last mm -hmm. at bat. Walk through the parking lot, they're gone. So you can't have it all ways. You can't, at the one hand, say you're going to right. go out on the top because nobody wins the ratings and, all the time. And he had no idea what the aftermath was going to be like. And it no. just, you know, there's a truth. It's, I, do you ever watch the newsroom? Oh, I um, love the newsroom. Okay, well, the thing the is, I, it's fun. It's great fun. But people <laughs> yeah. who don't work in TV yeah. ask me about it. And I say, yes, it's great fun. But, you know, we never talked like that. We were never, you know, we, we were really just chasing the stories, you know. But, and, and the other thing, nothing ever captures or can, and, and, we'll, and maybe the film that's about to be done about you will, the real brutality that goes on just working in network television. I mean, every day you walk in, there are no guarantees. You don't know whether you're going to be up or down. You may have a good right. contract. Very hard to convey that in film. Yes. You and I would disagree about one thing. I, I like the newsroom. I think Sorkin does a I fabulous I like it, set. but yeah. I don't know that it's, I have great fun watching it, but when friends say, oh, that's so exciting, is that what it was like? And I said, well, it never felt quite like, we never talked that much. It was but like. Your central point, that, that is very hard to convey that brutality of it. It's brutal. Again, I always, listen, I love it. I still love it. Uh, but you've got to love it to do it because mm -hmm. it, it's a brutally competitive world. Mm -hmm. And I think brutal is the right word. So um, I, I'm not trying not to bury the lead here, but I'm sure everybody <laughs> knows that, uh, and I and, and speak about redemption. Um, Robert Redford is going to make a movie about your contretemps with Bush called Truth. It's from your producer's book. It's being shot, I think, as we speak in Australia with Robert Redford playing you and uh, Kate Blanchett playing <coughs> Mary and I think Elizabeth Moss is in it also. Um, have you sat down with, uh, with Redford and talked about being Dan Rather? A little bit, uh, probably less than you might imagine, that I've known Bob Redford uh, since sometime in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Not a close friend of his, but I've interviewed him yeah. a number of times and mm -hmm. know him some. Uh, I was uh, honored and, yes, humbled. I know that's not a word usually associated with anchor people, but yeah. Are you going to walk around Texas that, that together? That he he'd take the role. And we talked by telephone some, and we talked uh, in Australia when they were shooting the film. I think they're finished shooting You, you the, went to the set? I went to the set in Australia. So they've taken Australia and made it look like... Well, only in Hollywood would they uh, take a film that needs to be set in uh, New York and Dallas and shoot it in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the way, now it's so, so you, while, while the character wasn't called Dan Rather, in broadcast news, Jack Nicholson played you. They called him, I think, Bill Rorish or something like that. And now you've got Redford playing you. I mean, what's, what's well, that Well, I'm not like? sure if that's the first part of that's true, but. Oh, well, uh, just look, go watch if, it if, sometime. If, no, look, <laughs> if, 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 if you're the anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News for almost a quarter of a century, Some, somebody's then gonna somebody is going to try to fictionalize that. But Truth, uh, which is the name of the film, will yes. be out mm -hmm. either late uh, next year or the following year, is based uh, on, on our, our reporting 
Abu Ghraib and the Bush story, mm -hmm. the two things are related. And yes, Robert Redford uh, plays your narrator and Kate Blanchett plays uh, Mary Mapes, by right. the way, because she w took the lead role as a reason it's being shot in Australia. Okay. I've joked about it before, but mm -hmm. it was, I think she said, I'll play this lead role, but you've got to shoot in Australia. Well, tell us just some of the questions Redford has asked you about how he gets into being you. Well, uh, I'm, I'm pause for a second because I want to be uh, trying to recall. No, well, well one, um, what about jealousy and envy, mm -hmm. which is always, look, if you're, if you're the center star doing anything, mm -hmm. whether you're the center star of the CBS Evening News or Hollywood movie, he was smart enough to know there's a lot of jealous, jealousy and envy. And how did you feel about that? How did that play at the time when the heat got on? Mm -hmm. And some people that you thought were bound to speak up for you and talk for you either disappeared or betrayed you, strong word, case. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd you feel about that? Uh, a little bit of that was one thing. The other was uh, how, did it, how was the decision made about the timing of leaving the evening news, which mm -hmm. was not my choice. Mm -hmm. It was those sort of things. But I will say that uh, I think he got most of the information, I know he got most of the information from watching videotape. For example, the sign off, the close of the last broadcast I did on the evening news, in which I basically said goodbye to the audience, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, he didn't ask me anything about that. He just studied the videotape. So, we'll say it's interesting to me. Actors have a tough job, you know. This was driven home to me that uh, when I saw Robert Redford in Australia, he was laser beam focused on what he had to do. We didn't spend a lot of time talking there. Did it, you watch him playing you? I did. For a bit, which is that is, weird? Fun? Yeah, that's that's strange. That's weird. <laughs> that, do you that's go weird. no no wait and I don't do that? No no no. I, did, <laughs> I, I didn't say anything, but it, it, it it's a strange experience. It's exciting, isn't it though? Yes. You're doing great. <laughs> life is good. Life is good. Look, life is good, you bet. I've been mightily blessed and very, very lucky. Partly because I've been able to make a living and yes, a pretty good living, doing what I always passionately wanted to do ever since I was a kid. Do you have another campaign in you? Do you think you're going to go out and cover these 016 so. uh, uh, From your race? mouth to God's ear, that if I have my health, you bet. What do you think? What do you think the chances are that it will be a Bush-Clinton contest? I, there's certainly a possibility of that happening. But Carol, you and I have covered politics long enough to know that overnight's a long time. A week is forever, and we're talking about a campaign. Yes. Uh, it, in 2016. So a lot of things can happen. But could there be a, a, a Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush campaign? Sure. I'd be a little surprised if it works out to be that way, only because right now that's what everybody's talking about. And most, most of the time this early, <coughs> what reporters such as the two of us decide might be a dream ticket, dream race, it seldom comes down to that. Which of the two do you think is least likely to run? Well, mind you, I think they're both running. I, I, I don't subscribe to the idea of, that, well, but. is Jeb Bush going to run? He's running. He's yeah. been running for some time. And is Hillary going to announce or not? Yeah, it's whether they're she's, going to announce. She's running. Yeah. No, I think it's pretty clear that uh, it's, it's more likely that Hillary Clinton will get the nomination on the Democratic side than it is Jeb Bush on the Republican side. But I can write you a scenario where it turns out the other way. I don't think that Hillary Clinton is a cinch for the Democratic nomination. If you have to bet it, that's the way you bet it. And she's certainly an odds-on favorite. That's not the case with Jeb Bush, at least not yet. Has America forgiven Texas enough for Perry to be, you know? Well, I don't think, I think America's forgiven Texas, if that's the right phrase, long ago. Uh, well. But Governor, Governor Perry, uh, look, it, I, he's also running, by the way. The, oh, yeah, this, yeah. And, 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 but, uh, you know. And maybe this time never, more look, effectively than you last never, time. You, you never say never. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, he, he hurt himself very badly the last, mm -hmm. last campaign. Uh, is it possible he come out of nowhere? <laughs> yes, miracles do happen. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the good book says the, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong. 
But as reporters, we say that is the way to bet it. Well, on that, you know, our only ratherism today is from the good book. But, Dan, our time is up. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you so much. So great, great to see you. So great to have you here. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.